Well, how are we doing this evening? Doing good? Got a full house tonight, looking good. On this fall evening where like jackets and scarves are legit, huh? At least as far as Austin, Texas goes. Hey, listen, tonight you can leave and have a pumpkin latte and not feel like a poser. <laughs> fall is here, right? So glad you guys are here. If you're new or visiting, uh, glad you're with us tonight. My name is Chad Kinzer. I serve as a downtown PM campus pastor, one of our preaching pastors. Um, privilege for me to share with you tonight in this capacity. Uh, right now, we're caught up in a series of messages that's going to take us quite some time. Uh, we're working chapter by chapter through the book of Exodus, the Old Testament book of Exodus. And so uh, we've been here the past few weeks, and so if you haven't uh, been with us, I encourage you to catch up online. We've only had like three or four sermons here, so uh, you could do that uh, pretty easily. But we're looking forward to where we're headed, and here's what we're seeing in the book of Exodus. Here's what the whole book is about. God's great saving work for his people. That's what the whole book is about. So here's what we see in Exodus. We only see how God saves us, but we see what God is doing to us and what he's doing for us in saving us, and then also why he's saving us. So we see the how, the what, and the why of salvation through this book of Exodus, and it's been a good journey so far, and it will continue to be that. And so here's what we're going to do tonight in covering a large chunk of Scripture. So when I say large chunk of Scripture, I mean we're going to be covering the things captured in chapter 4, verse 19, or verse 18, all the way through chapter 6 and verse 9. And so we're not going to read all of that tonight, but we will in our time together cover everything that's happening in the narrative here. But I want to tell you what we are going to be talking about tonight. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and open up to uh, Exodus chapter 5. That's where we're going to be, Exodus chapter 5. And I want to tell you what we're going to be talking about right out of the gates before we dive in. Here's what I want us to walk away with tonight to see. That God, he doesn't save us in the way we think he should. God doesn't always save us in the way we think he should. Because his purpose isn't only the rescue, but it's that we might know him deeply. God doesn't save us in the way we think he should, the way we would expect him to. Because his purpose is more than just the rescue, but it's that we might know him deeply, right? So I want us to read a passage of scripture that uh, sort of captures a little bit of what's going on in this passage uh, to kind of give us some framework as we dive in tonight. And so I want us to look at Exodus 5. We'll start in verse 19. Exodus 5, 19. And we'll read down through 6, chapter 6, verse 9. If you don't have a Bible, the words will be on the screen behind me. I'll, I'll read this passage and then we'll jump in from there. Exodus 5, starting in verse 19. The word of Christ speaks to us like this. The foreman of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble... When they said, you shall by no means reduce the number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants. And you have put a sword in their hand to kill us. And Moses turned to the Lord and said, oh Lord, why have you done this evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but... But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I, was, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land to which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, I say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from the slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God that you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob and I will give it to you as a, for a possession. I am the Lord. And Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and their harsh slavery. Well, every one of us in the room tonight loves a good happily ever after, 
Every one of us in the room tonight loves a good story that's a happily ever after. Every one of us, no matter who you are, no matter what age you are, we love the ending of a story that is happily ever after. And even if you're the kind of person in the room tonight who's jaded and cynical because you haven't had quite that story and you're like, those stories aren't possible in real life. Those are just storybooks and movies. Even you, if that's the kind of person you are, there's something deep down that resonates with that story and you want it for yourself. Now, this is the world I live in all the time as a, as a dad of two young girls at home. Every movie we watch, every book we read is always happily ever after. But as I think about it, that's the kind of desire, that's the kind of drive that's playing out in all of our lives. And even if you're the kind of person tonight who's like, no, 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 not me. I'm a dude, man, I'm hard, right? Like, happily ever after, whatever, I, that's not my story. No, 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 it is. It is because no one in the room tonight has the desire, you know what, it's not happily ever after for me. It's alone and miserable ever after. That's what I want. And if that is you tonight, man, let's talk, dude. Like, you don't got to live there. It's just lighten up, you know? So it's driving us all the time. And here's how I know this. Because very often you and I will look at ourselves and we think to, we think to ourselves, man, if I could just have that, if I could just get there, then I would be happy. Then I would be content. Then I would be satisfied. If, if I could just have that. So for some of you, it's marriage. If I could just be married, for others of you, that, that's too far down the road. If I could just get a date, man, like if I, if I could just get a date, you know, we'll talk about, man, I want one of those, you know. For some of you, it's a career, it's a job. If I could just have that career, if I could have that kind of house or that promotion or that platform or that position or that approval from people, if I could just get that, if I could just get over there, then it would all be better. But here's what I've come to see in my own life. That no matter where it's been my marriage or having kids or becoming a pastor or dealing with insecurities in my own life of not having a dad growing up or the thousand kinds of things I've had that go through my head, that if I could just get there, if I could just deal with that, if I could just acquire this, then it would be better. Here's what I found. That no matter the acquisition, no matter the addition, no matter the new development in my life, Sure, there are joys and there are blessings with these things, but there's also, there's also the fact that they come with them their own challenges. Also, there's new anxieties and new temptations you didn't have before. And so sometimes we think that if I could just get there, then these old anxieties, these old temptations, they're going to go away. And that would be just fine because I don't want those anymore. I want new. But here's what ends up happening. You have those old temptations, those old anxieties roll into a new situation compounded with new anxieties and new temptations. And it's not happily ever after like you thought it would be. So then we get jaded, we get cynical, we wonder, is that even possible? But here's what I've come to understand. Life is a lot more about the condition of our souls. It's a lot more about the condition of our souls and how we're getting to know God and treasure God right where we are in the thick of our circumstances, right as they are, than it is about working to give ourselves a change of scenery to create our own illusion of happily ever after. You see, when Jesus comes to us as a rescuer, when Jesus comes to us as a savior, he does so personally. And he wants us to get to know him and trust him personally. And here's what that's going to mean. It's going to mean that he doesn't rescue us always in the way we think he should or the way we wished he would sometimes. Because his rescue is going to involve something much more than just our own plan. You see, through rescuing us, Jesus wants us to get to know him. And here's what he's giving us in that He's giving us himself, which is something that you and I can take with us, something that you and I can have to stabilize us much longer than when relief for our situation that we wanted rescue from is no longer needed. When relief is no longer needed, when rescue is no longer needed because we're there, we still have him and he walked us through all along. He doesn't always rescue us from stuff. He walks us through stuff. And that's exactly what we see happening with the people of Israel in Exodus chapter 5. God's coming to them saying, I'm going to deliver you from slavery. But what we're going to see tonight is he actually doesn't deliver them right away, take them out. He's going to actually deliver them through slavery. He's trying to show them what you need ultimately isn't to get out of the situation. What you need is me. True deliverance, hear this, true deliverance isn't so much having the deliverance itself, but it's having the deliverer himself. We want the deliverer. 
And so last week we talked about in Exodus that Moses uh, was stumbled upon, really, well, he stumbled upon God by a burning bush. God comes to him in a burning bush. And he tells Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and let him know, I want to let my people go. And then, and then he says, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you all these miraculous signs to perform before the people so that they would know that I'm the Lord and they would know that I sent you. And so Moses says, I'm in. I'm all in. Now, reluctantly, we learned last week that Moses had all these excuses that he, he brought forward, but ultimately he's, he's in, right? And so where we pick up the story tonight is with Moses packing up his family, packing up his family, leaving Midian, heading back on into Egypt. And what he's going to do is he's going to meet his brother in the wilderness, Aaron. He's going to meet his brother there. They're going to set this whole plan forward. Aaron's going to talk to Pharaoh. Moses will perform the signs. They're going to get Israel together. They're going to go to Pharaoh, and they're going to do this thing. Now, here's the thing. If all, if all we knew in the story was what we know up to this point, if we didn't have Prince of Egypt, if we didn't have Charlton Heston, Ten Commandments, we didn't have these movies, we didn't know the story in front of us, if all we knew is the story right here, it would seem like the story is about to be over. It would seem like the story's about to have its end, like God's got his man ready. He gets Moses ready. He gets him to leave Midian, go back on into Egypt, confront the, the most powerful ruler in the world, Pharaoh. He puts wind in his sails, encouraging him to go do that. He gives him all these miraculous signs to blow people's mind. It feels like the guy who's going to leave Midian, the comeback kid from Midian, storms into Pharaoh's house, plunders his goods, and rides off into the sunset. That's how it feels like the, the narrative is about to go. But that's not what happens at all. Moses and Aaron, they head back on into Egypt. And they get the people of Israel together just as they were told. Aaron tells the people of God's great rescue plan. Moses performs all the miraculous signs. And then the people of God respond in verse 31, chapter 4. It says, The people believed. And when they had heard the Lord visited the people of Israel and had seen their affliction... They bowed their heads and they worshipped. So they go on in, they tell the people, they see the signs, the people hear, the people believe, and the people worship, and they get fired up. We're getting out of slavery, but Moses and, uh, Moses and Aaron say, first we've got to go to Pharaoh. And it's right there that things begin to get complicated. Now before Moses left Midian, God told him just how this conversation with Pharaoh would go. God told him just how this conversation with Pharaoh would go. He gave him a heads up of exactly what to expect. Look back at chapter 4 and verse 21. He says the, Lord, says, the Lord told Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Do you see that? So God comes to Moses and says, I want you to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go hard in Pharaoh's heart so he won't let the people go. So God's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. So, so, so if I'm Moses right here, I don't know what you're thinking, but if I'm Moses in the wilderness and I'm kind of getting this whole thing from God, I'm going to raise my hand and go, I don't get the riddle. So do you want your people free or not? Like you say, hey, let's go set them free, but then you're going to do stuff so they're not free. I'm not quite sure how this is working. And here's what's even crazier through the book of Exodus, as we're going to see later chapters. There's several more times where it's going to show up that God's going to come and he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And so this is exactly what happens. Moses and Aaron, they go on into Pharaoh. In chapter 5, here's how it goes down, verses 1 and 2. Afterward, Moses and Aaron, they went into Pharaoh and they said, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. Moreover, I will not let Israel go. So they go before Pharaoh. Pharaoh completely opposes them. And then he begins to mock God. So who is this Lord you're even talking about? That he's actually Lord. Don't you know that I'm God? That I'm going to obey his voice? No, 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 no. I'm not letting them go. And then it gets worse. It gets worse. Pick up in verse 6. Sorry, verse 4. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people of Israel away from their work? Go back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens? 
The same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves, but the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them, and you shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, Let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Let heavier work be laid on them, on the men, so they may labor in it and pay no regard to lying words. And so here's what happens. Pharaoh opposes the request to let the people go, and then he doubles down on their work and he increases the oppression. So you say, what, what's God doing here? Like, what in the world is going on? He tells Moses, I want to set my people free, but then he goes and he hardens Pharaoh's heart so he doesn't set the people free, but not only that, he moves it in Pharaoh's heart to not just not let the people free, but to actually make it harder. So, so what's going on? Remember what I said in the beginning. God doesn't save us in the way we think he should. God doesn't save us in the way we think he should because it's not only about the rescue, but it's the, that we might know him deeply. And so hear this tonight. God is far more concerned with keeping you and drawing you in than he is with making you comfortable. God is far more concerned with keeping you and drawing he, you in than he is with making you comfortable. And so God is committed to you knowing him and worshiping him and treasuring him. And because he's committed to those things, he's also committed to what oftentimes is the painful process of peeling your fingers off of lesser gods. Peeling your fingers off of other things that you and I hold on to for security and stability. He wants to peel our fingers off of those things so that we could actually see him rightly as our true security, our true stability. And I call that process often painful because what it requires many times is for God to allow difficult things to come into our life to prove our faith genuine. He allows difficult things to come into our life in order to make our faith in him genuine. So so for God, it's not enough for him that you and I would just come around him and say, I believe in you, I trust you. So he loves us too much to leave us there. What he's going to do, he's going to come around and say, okay, great. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to expose all the areas where you really don't believe me and you really don't trust me so that we can come to a place where you really believe me and you really walk in trusting me. I want you to actually live in that, not just feel better about yourself because of a religious confession. I want you to actually walk in that. Okay. So how does Israel respond to the word of Pharaoh that things are going to get worse? Chapter 5, verse 20. They met Moses and Aaron who were waiting for them and they, they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge because you have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh. I'm not sure what all that means, but apparently Pharaoh didn't like them. And so they, they interpret that as they stink in the sight of Pharaoh. You have made a stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and you have put a sword in their hand to kill us. And so Israel turns on God and they turn on Moses. The second that they hear following God is actually going to make their lives more difficult, they walk away. And this is so us. This this is so us. Here's what happens. In a span of 20 verses, Israel goes from worshiping God to walking out on him. They go from saying, we're all in with you, to now we want nothing to do with you. And why? Because you won't give me, God, what I want. Because you won't give me, God, what I want. Now listen. At no point here was God playing games with Israel by telling them he was going to set them free and then really not. By no no point here was he uh, trying to string them along or lie to them. No, 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 no. He doesn't string us along. He doesn't play games with us. Nothing was entering in to the lives of Israel that didn't first pass through his hands. He knew exactly what was happening with Israel. He knew exactly what would happen with Israel. And he knew exactly how hard it was going to be. God knew. God knew. He was still trying to set his people free. And the same is true for us. God is not playing games with you when he doesn't give you an immediate relief from your situation. 
God's not playing games with you when he doesn't give you what you want, when you want it, in the precise way that you want it. He's not playing games with you in those moments. No, very often what happens when he lets the when he lets the situation, the suffering, the difficulty to continue, what he's often doing in those moments is he's with us there in the moment with us, but he's also then revealing the fickleness of our hearts in his great love for us. And here's why. Because God wants us to at least deal with him honestly. God doesn't want your worship of him just because you think he's a genie in a bottle that can get you what you want. He's not a lucky rabbit's foot that if you just rub it the right way, then your life is magical, right? No, God is God and we worship him, not for what he does for us, although he does lots of things for us, but because of who he is. And so in those moments of difficulty and trial, he will reveal the fickleness of our hearts so that we can at least begin to deal honest with him and then get true rescue and then get true worship. And so it's true for us in the room tonight. The genuineness of your faith, the genuineness of my faith is revealed when God doesn't give us what we want. When God doesn't give you what you want, that's the moment when the genuineness of your faith and your worship is revealed. Because how you respond to God in those moments reveals what's really in your heart toward God. When God doesn't play by your rules, how you respond to him tells you what's in your heart toward God. So very often what you and I would rather have is no fight, no struggle, no temptations. God, just let us go on about our lives the way we want to go on about our lives. You see, wanting God is really easy when you get to keep your preferences and you get to keep your plans and when he gets to play by your rules. Wanting God in those moments is very, very easy. Wanting God in the moments where they see in verse 31 of chapter 4, oh, you've heard us, you've seen our affliction, you're going to deliver us? Well, then I want to worship you now. It's really easy in those moments. And why? Well, I'll call God whatever God wants me to call him because he's playing by my rules. So really, I'm God in that moment. That's why it's so easy to want him and worship him. I'm God. He's serving my purposes. But God wants far more for us from that. He doesn't just want to deliver us from sin. He doesn't just want to rescue us from suffering. He wants us to get to know him in the process. And so please hear this tonight, because this might make so much sense of your life for some of you. He wants you to get to know him in the process, and this is why very often the Christian life feels more difficult than it was before you were a Christian. Anybody in the room tonight that living the Christian life seems a lot more difficult than it was before I was a Christian. C.S. Lewis writes a book called Mere Christianity. In the book, he has this really great quote on temptation, but it serves a broader principle I think we understand. He says, you finally understand how strong the enemy is when you begin to fight against it. You finally understand how strong the enemy is when you fight against it. You know how strong sin and temptation and your own little kingdom reigns in your heart when you begin to live for some other kingdom and that kingdom rises up and you you find out how strong those sins, those tendencies, those temptations, those lures in your heart really are when all of a sudden God wants to put them down. You didn't know before because you just went along with them. But now there's another kingdom to live for, a better kingdom. Your own little kingdom wants to challenge it all the time. So here's the question we have to answer tonight. Do you want God or do you just want what you want? Do you want God or do you just want what you want? Do you want more of Jesus? Do you want deeper trust with him? Do you want greater affections for him and his purposes to want him? Or do you just want your own little version of happily ever after? And if he gets you that, then sure, I'll take Jesus. You see, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8. He says, I don't consider that these present sufferings are even worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. So here's what Paul's saying. God, whatever you want to do, if that's suffering for me, to you, for you to reveal stuff in me, then bring me through suffering. If that's the world wanting to persecute me, fine, let them persecute me because there's nothing that can happen to me that's going to ever keep me from you. And so I just want more of you. And so if it's this stuff that has to happen, I'll submit to whatever. I just want you. That stuff isn't even worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed to us at the day of Christ Jesus. 
The psalmist in Psalm 73, verse 25, he says it this way, the same kind of thing in his own little words, he packages it this way. Whom have I in heaven but you? And on earth I desire nothing beside you, God. On earth I want nothing but you. Do you hear the heartbeat of the biblical writers? God, I just want you. I want you, just give me more of you. If that means suffering, if that means difficulty, then I'll endure whatever, I'll go through whatever because I just want more of you. Give me you. There's no one like you, God. This is the heart of true freedom. This is the heart of true deliverance and liberty. I just want God. This is the kind of heartbeat that God was trying to develop in Israel and this is the heartbeat that he's developing in us. But Israel wasn't there yet. Israel wasn't there yet. And so here's what happens in verse 22. Moses cries out to God. Look at what Moses says. It says, Moses turned to the Lord and he said, O Lord, why have you done this evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since it came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people and you have not delivered your people at all. This is just honest Moses, right? This is just a prayer of faith. God, what are you doing? God, where are you? Why is all this happening? God, did did I just make, is this just a dream? This is Moses just being honest with God. It's okay to get there in your own life if you know something of this confusion. God's not scared of your questions. But Exodus chapter 6, God responds to Moses. We'll pick it up in verse 6 and look what he says. He says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, that you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the Egyptian uh, burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. So in the midst of what looks like the abandonment of God, God comes back and he answers the questions. I thought you were going to deliver us, God, and God comes back and here's what he does in his response in these three verses. Seven different times he gives us an I will statement. And here's exactly what God's doing. It's as if to say, hey, listen, I'm faithful to my word, Moses. I'm faithful to my word. I know exactly what I'm doing. I see you. I see what's going on. I'm not backing out. Just walk with me. Look at what he says. I will bring you out. I will deliver you. I will redeem you. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. I will bring you into the land of blessing and I will give to you that land for possession. Seven I will statements. So it looks like God's backing out, but he's actually all in. Now this is driving home crystal clear the point that I tried to make in the beginning, that God doesn't save us in the way we think he should because his purpose in saving us isn't just the rescue, but it's that we might know him. And so very often, God wants to bring freedom into your life and he wants to push you deeper into his saving purposes by actually bringing suffering and difficulty into your life. That, that's a hard truth, right? Because it's when you're under the pressure of difficulty and suffering that true things really start to surface in you. And so God's saying, I, I'm not going to exempt you from those things, but I'm going to lead you through those things as great as these seven I will statements are here. And not one of them do we see God saying, I will keep you from harm and difficulty. I will keep you from suffering and difficulty, not one time. But what he does say is I will lead you and I will bring you out. You will come out, but I will lead you through that. And this is critical for us to hear in the room tonight, especially because we're a younger congregation. There's a tendency for us in our youth to think that we're sort of invincible that we're sort of young and energetic and creative enough to be able to control the things coming into my life and the things going out of my life. Enough to say, no, 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 I'm exempt from suffering and difficulty because I can control peace and ease and comfort. 
I've got enough money. I've got enough savvy. I know how to keep myself in the clear. But don't buy the lie. Don't buy the lie that says following Jesus means you won't, you won't ever get hurt or that, that life won't ever get hard. Jesus never promised anything like that. You see, the good news of Jesus isn't that you don't get trouble, you don't get difficulty, you don't get suffering. No, no, no. The good news of Jesus is whatever comes your way, you get God and he will be enough for you to walk you through and sustain you and you get to know him. That's the good news. And so here's what I know. Just, I mean, today's my birthday, whatever that's worth. But 32 years, I'm almost old enough to preach. Uh, here's what I've come to know. You're either in a season of suffering, you've just come out of a season of suffering, or suffering's coming for you. Like, that's the three categories of life. Right? And the good news of the gospel says, whichever category you're in, God is enough, and he has not abandoned you. He has not abandoned you. And so I know something of this in my own life with God here even recently. A few months ago, I took my position here as campus pastor and um, a position I felt called to for a long time, uh, sort of stepping into everything I believe God's called me to. And, uh, but here's what ended up happening. I took this position back in late April. And as soon as I stepped in, like as soon as I stepped in, I, I was seized with anxiety and fear and, and, and panic attacks like, like I've never known in my life. Seized up with anxiety and fear, like to points where I couldn't even leave my house. I, fear of failure trickled into fear of just about everything and irrational. I would tell you things I was afraid of and you would go, you're crazy. But I would say, but, but, but it clammed me up to the point where my wife, I, mean, I went through counseling and my wife was, I'm not even sure if this is the man I married. It, things just kind of weighed in on me. In May, I had a complete breakdown. And I had no idea what God was doing. No idea. I feel like I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I feel like I'm stepping into all that I've been called to. And the bottom's falling out. But here's what I'm coming to see. Through prayer and through loads of counseling. Through the community that's helped me walk through. Is that God has led me through this. Even more, God is the one who led me to all of that. He didn't keep me from it. It wasn't like, oh, magical little pastor moment. You're not ever going to experience anything. No, he, he led me to it. He led me through it. He did it. He was right there in the middle, even though I couldn't see him and still wonder about some of the stuff. And he did so because through all of this, over the last several months, I've learned increasingly about who I am as a son of God because of Jesus in ways that I would have never learned otherwise. And so here's, so what ended up happening is, is I had begun to believe that, that ministry was built on me and what I was bringing to the table. That, that it was all built on my gifting, my charisma, my personality, what I had to do, I wouldn't have said that then, but that's exactly what was happening. And I had created for myself an expectation in my own head that I couldn't live up to. Thinking that was everyone else's expectation of me too. And I couldn't live up to it. And it threw me in the tank. And God didn't exempt me from that. He could have peeled it back. He could have stopped every bit of it. He, but, but no. He knew May was coming. He knew the breakdown was coming. And he led me all the way through every bit of that. And here's exactly why. Because he was saving me. He was saving me. Saving me from myself. Saving me from harming my family in the church by continuing to believe lies and continue in sins that I kept covered for too long. He was saving me and through suffering and difficulty, he was exposing all of that and strengthening me through repentance and through suffering. And in moments when I felt like I was falling apart, God was holding my hand leading me through, and he's saying, I will bring you out. But I'm with you. So maybe you're hearing this tonight, and, um, and you hear about God bringing difficulty into your life or suffering to bring you freedom, and that sounds strange to you. 
maybe you're in a really difficult season right now and you're like, that's the, last, that's the kind of last message I wanted to hear tonight. But let me encourage you with this, if I can. Let me encourage you with this. This shouldn't sound strange to us at all. Because this is exactly how God saves us from our sins. He has saved you and I from our sins through suffering. Not our own suffering, but the suffering of Jesus at the cross. This is exactly how he's always brought freedom through suffering. This is exactly how he's bringing freedom to the Israelites was through suffering. This is how God's always brought suffering, but it finally and ultimately and authoritatively landed on Jesus. And so Jesus, he suffered once and for all time for our sins. And so here's why that's such significant news. Because that means that you and I, because he suffered for our sins, you and I will never have to suffer for the ways we've disobeyed and rejected God. Jesus suffered for that. Jesus was punished for that. You don't have to. And so here's what we now know through seasons of suffering in our own lives. Because they still come. But here's how we can now understand suffering in light of the suffering of Jesus. Seasons of difficulty and suffering in your life. They're not God punishing you. Sin was already punished. They're not God forgetting you. Jesus was already forsaken. It's not random stuff just happening to you. God is working all things, every difficult season, every painful season, every confusing season. He's working it together for your good and for your rescue. From sin, from lies you've believed, and he's making you a new person that you might worship him for real. For real. He's saving you. And so we want a happily ever after. And we should. And we should. And here's why. Because happily ever after is actually ours in Jesus. Because of what he's done for us on the cross, a happily ever after is ours because we have the Spirit of God and we have the future with God and it's actually really ours. Now it doesn't come in the timeline we'd want to, it doesn't come in the way we'd want it to, but it's actually ours and we were hardwired for happily ever after. We just typically have a different timeline for it. And so suffering and difficulty will come into your life. And I can't tell you how, and I can't tell you when God's going to deliver you from it. But here's what I can promise you. I will bring you out, declares the Lord. I will deliver you. I will redeem you. I will make you mine. I will be your God. I will bring you out, and I will give to you. Seven I will statements of God in the midst of our mess. And so here's how Jesus says it. He says, in this life, you will have trouble. But he says, take heart, because I've overcome the world. John 16, in this world, you will have troubles, but take heart. I've overcome the world. I'm not leaving you. I'm not forsaking you. I'm standing there right there with you, and I'm leading you through I will bring you out. You will be with me. Let's pray together. Oh God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your word that, that speaks to our mess, that speaks to our confusion, that speaks to the honesty and the difficulty of life that you're not foreign to it, that you're not caught off guard by it, that you're not surprised by it, but that you're fully aware of it and you're right here with us. Father, for my friends in the room tonight who maybe are walking through a tough season, walking through a dark season, I pray that they would be reminded afresh tonight, would you somehow by your Holy Spirit even do more than has been done to this point? And with your spirit even now as we pray, would you lift them with a faith and a confidence in your presence that's with them even now? That you will deliver, you will redeem, you will bring out, you will give. Father, would you be with those who are suffering even now? Lift their hearts. For those who are walking even now through seasons of blessing and comfort, I pray that you would stabilize and secure their faith for right now to be a voice of encouragement, a voice of patience, and a voice of endurance with their friends who are suffering. I pray also that you would prepare them for moments when it's coming for them. 
God, I thank you that even as we talk like this in honesty, it's not doomsday. It's not. You have promised us we'll have troubles, but you've promised us even more than that, that you have overcome the world. That these difficulties and sufferings that come into our life, they don't define us and they won't stay forever because you have promised us face-to-face -face communion with you. You have promised us glory and reigning with Christ in all righteousness. That is ours. Our Father, would you lift our heads to see you even in the midst of the storm? We declare, along with all the saints through the ages, you are Lord, King Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray.